Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this El Cano debate, jointly organized with the Fundación Botín here in Madrid. My name is Charles Powell, and I'm the director of the El Cano Royal Institute. And today, as you know, we're going to be talking about post-Merkel Germany, continuity or change. And of course, uh, this is a very complex issue, which we can tackle from lots of different angles. But to do so, we have a group of truly outstanding speakers. And let me start by thanking them all for having taken the time to join us. I'm going to uh, introduce them very briefly in the order in which they will be speaking. We have with us Ana Carvajosa. Buenos dias, Ana. Thank you for being here. Buenos dias. <laughs> Ana is a, a very experienced Spanish journalist and writer. Uh, many of you will have read her book, um, which I think is one of the best books available in Spanish about recent German political life. And she is currently joining us from Brexit land, from a happy old UK. Um, and she seems to be surviving very well, nevertheless. Thank you, Anna. Um, we also have with, with us Christian uh, Odendal, who is the chief economist at the Center for European Reform. Good morning, Christian, and thank you for joining us. Good morning from Berlin. We have a long-standing relationship with um, our friends at the Center for European Reform, so I'm very glad you can be with us um, today. We also have um, Sophie Ponschlegel, who is uh, the Connecting Europe project leader and senior policy analyst at the European Policy Center. Good morning, Sophie. Thank you for being with us. Hi there. And she is in Berlin. Um, no, I'm in Brussels. Sorry, in Brussels. <laughs> sorry, you, you mentioned this earlier. Sorry. So Sophie is in, in the heart of our wonderful European Union. And we have also have with us um, Sahin Vallet. Good morning, Sahin, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, he is at the German Council of Foreign Affairs, and he is the head of the geoeconomics program there. Um, and the more astute amongst you will know that he is French, and he will no doubt be uh, enlightening us um, by offering us his ideas on um, not obviously not just Franco-German relations, but also how all of this is going to impact the European project. And finally, we have our very own homegrown Miguel Otero, um, who is a senior analyst here at the Real Instituto Volcano. Thank you very much, Miguel, and thank you for um, cajoling or convincing or coercing these friends and colleagues of yours uh, to join us this morning. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, each of you to intervene for about seven minutes. Before I do so, let me remind you that, that you can send in your questions either through our Twitter feed or through um, the following um, address, events at rielcano.org. Let me repeat that, events at rielcano.org. And your questions will be channeled through to me and I hope that um, I will be able to reflect your um, input as adequately as I can. So without further ado, Anna, the microphone is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much um, for the invitation and I'm very honored to be um, here virtually surrounded by such clever and well-informed people. Um, I will try to speak a bit about uh, the mood in Germany. And when you ask me whether um, there's going to be change or continuity, I would say Germans voted for change. But of course, being Germans, um, it would be an incremental change. It would be more of an evolution rather than a, a revolution or a disruption. Um, I think it's very well known um, that stability is very appreciated uh, value among Germans as uh, the four consecutive mandates of Angela Merkel have shown, being her um, a symbol of stability. Um, she embodies probably like uh, no other politician, this longing for um, security and stability. And then the fact that uh, Olaf Scholz, the social democratic uh, candidate was the preferred by the voters, um, his party, but also him, um, and having him play the role of the most Merkelian wannabe candidate during this campaign um, also supports and, and shows this fear of disruption. So, yes, um, Sunday there was a sort of political earthquake 
but it was an earthquake a la Germany, so always moderate and um, incremental, as I said at the beginning. Um, but nevertheless, I, I really think Germans won't change, and they've shown that in this election. They do consider that the status quo, it's not an option. A majority want a greener country and a strong push on issues like digitalization or um, uh, fixing the, the, the crumbling infrastructures. And um, yeah, I mean, because I was reading these days, no, compared to other countries, to Italy or Spain, of course, um, it, it, it's quite a limited and moderate uh, desire of change. But I think it's interesting to look at uh, within the German society. And if we look at the polls that were published the day of the, day of the elections, we see that 51% of the um, voters said they wanted some kind of change, or correction or policy adjustment um, in Germany. And 40% said they wanted fundamental change. Um, what is interesting is to look at what happened when they asked the same question in 2017. And um, the desire for change is much stronger now. Only 19% then in 2017 said they wanted a fundamental change and 34% said they wanted some change. If we look at who wants change in Germany, according to the polls, we see that it's mostly people, voters from AFD, the extreme right, and the Linke, both parties that have suffered losses in this election. Um, but on the third position appears the Greens. They obtained 15% uh, of the vote, of the votes, some, you know, it, it, they're not as big as the what, what, what expectations were some weeks ago, but still is their best result. And I also think that the influence of the Greens goes well beyond their electoral results, that the climate crisis has dominated this campaign and that no political party can now afford not to have a detailed climate program. Um, and the green vote also take us to the generational divide because it's been uh, younger German voters have uh, supported the Green Party and also the Liberal Party, whereas the older voters have uh, voted for um, the so-called traditional parties, the Social Democrats and the Conservatives. Um, but even if there are minority in the government, the Greens and the Liberals, they will most certainly be in, in the next German government. And also there will be kingmakers, um, which allow us to think that they will have a pretty big influence. Um, we saw this picture um, of, of, of the green um, leaders and the, and the liberals together. They are the ones setting the, the, the pace, the tone, and up to now, they're, they're leading this process, no? Um, but also, besides the political parties, I also think um, that the social mood in Germany has somehow changed. Um, as I mentioned, overall, among the younger generations. The, because the urgency with which they leave this climate emergency, it's completely different from the way all the people in the traditional parties uh, look at this issue. Um, if we see the protests that took place in Berlin before the elections, where ten, tens of thousands protested in the German capital uh, for climate change, and uh, Greta Thunberg was there, it's not a coincidence that uh, she chose Berlin. Um, but uh, these past years in Germany, speaking to, to young people, I was, um, it, it was quite revealing uh, the way they, they see things. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little anecdote. I went once to Dortmund to a, a summer camp of Fridays for Future where they're, they were rehearsing um, strategies and how to demonstrate, but also 
uh, their program and uh, what place they want to occupy in society. And I found this uh, woman who told me, listen, I, my parents are going to be very upset. I was going to study in university, but I finally decided uh, that the planet can't wait. So I'm not going to go to university. I'm going to dedicate all my energy to um, activism. Um, of course, this woman is not representative of anything, but I, I really thought it was very revealing that uh, for them, status quo is not an option. We've all also seen it in the Constitutional Court ruling on, on, on climate change, condemning Germany for not having uh, ambitious enough uh, policies. And that's why I think that um, regardless of the political constellation and the, the coalition of parties that will be formed in the next weeks or months, um, I think business as usual uh, will not be an option, uh, at least uh, when it comes to the, to the environment. And that is also uh, reflected in the, in the polls where they say that... Uh, what, when they ask what are Germans worried about, uh, we see a very substantial change in this election compared to the past election. Uh, climate issues, but also social justice, have been very important in this election compared to the last election where more uh, refugees and security and other uh, topics were in the agenda. So I, I also see there um, quite a change. Um, I would also like to speak, um, because I think it was mentioned at some of the, Miguel mentioned it, I, I don't know if in his article or somewhere, um, about the gender balance. Um, it is true that somehow there's not going to be substantial change when we look at the composition at the Bundestag, uh, where there's a slight increase on the representation of women uh, compared to uh, last time, but still not, not so different from the previous time. But I think um, there would be, um, if I could call it a reverse change uh, in the new government, because we're moving from a female chancellor to a male chancellor, that's obvious, as um, the, tats, the newspaper pointed out the day after the election, it is a boy, um, it is a male chancellor. But then also, if we look at, uh, the positions that are going to be filled in below, we probably will have a deputy chancellor and we'll have a finance minister. And they're the two figures that uh, are very prominent and very keen on occupying them. And uh, that is Christian Lindner from the Liberals and Robert Habeck from the Greens. Um, Knowing them a bit, and I think every German knows them, um, I think we can say their approach to politics in terms of ego or impulsiveness uh, differs quite a bit from that of um, Angela Merkel and this uh, invisible uh, vanity. Um, so I think uh, there will be a change also in the political style. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if okay. um, I should Perfect. leave Thank you very room much. to <laughs> someone Thank else. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, of course, the rest of you must feel free to uh, challenge Anna on some of those um, very interesting points that she's made. So a rumble, perhaps more than an earthquake, but at the same time, um, significant expectations when it comes to challenging the status quo, particularly on the part of younger voters um, who have, who are overrepresented, perhaps as a proportion of the population among the liberal and the green electorate. I'm told that our YouTube connection um, was a little bit late, so let me just say that was Ana Carvajosa, a well-known, experienced uh, journalist and writer. And I'm now going to hand over to um, Christian Odendal, who is the chief economist at the Center for European Reform, based in Berlin. Christian, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you very much, and, and um, lots to agree with. And I always love to have this, um, you know, an outside international take on, on on Germany and the election. And I think it's the the, the what she said, an earth break, but a very German one. Um, I thought was a very good frame for this. Um, on economic policy, uh, my focus. I just want to take a first the, the the chance to look back a bit. Um, in two thousand and five, when Angela Merkel started, she started as a sort of 
neoliberal reformer, if I may say that, and almost lost the election because of it. Um, then she basically did nothing because in the grand coalition, there were not many reforms left or not much energy to reform anything. And then she inherited a sort of, or she, an economic booms of sorts fell into her lap. Um, after the financial crisis, Germany again recovered very quickly. And in the Euro crisis, Germany was a sort of anchor of, of European economic stability. And I think that must have informed sort of her view on economic policy, because when she started in 2005, she was being told by the economics establishment in Germany that lots of reforms were still needed to, to cure this sick man of Europe. And yet she did nothing and um, saw, the, saw the German economy booming and, um, and, and generating uh, several million jobs in the process. Um, then, you know, Merkel had to deal with various crises that then overshadowed all economic concerns. Um, so I would say that, you know, starting now from this election, we can say, well, this last decade of crisis has left us with quite a substantial to-do list. Um, take digitalization, for example. I think the pandemic, I mean, it was clear before the pandemic that Germany was not a, a front runner when it comes to digitalization. But I think the pandemic has brought that point home in a way that that sort of then um, large chunks of the of German voters understand um, that a lot needs to be done and a lot of investment is needed. Um, take the transformation of German industry. I mean, it's it's very fortunate for Germany that Tesla is building its big factory in Germany, but it also shows that there is a whole new car industry cropping up and um, the German uh, car industry and its entire supply chain have to make a huge transition and have to make that very quickly. Um, and this is this even made it into the into the party platform of the left party, our socialists, uh, who didn't do very well in the election, but still um, they wanted to put together a 20 billion euros per year transformation fund for the German car industry. Where you think like, really, is, is that is that sort of usually a core part of the of the um, of the of a socialist platform to dish out uh, huge investment sums to the industry? But I think that shows you that there is a deep and broad consensus about. That that quite substantial investment is necessary to to bring uh, to to help the German industry make that transition, and of course climate change is standing above all of this. Um, somehow, I think abroad, correct me if I'm wrong, Germany has this green image, um, but this is almost entirely unjustified. Um, if you look at the numbers, Germany is still one of the worst polluters per capita in Europe, um, and Merkel's track record on climate change is just terrible. And so this is where we are. The transition that we still have to make on traffic, on buildings, on industry is, is, is very substantial. And so I think there was a broad sense also in the, in the voting population that while Merkel was a very experienced and sort of sober, rational crisis manager, just like the Germans like it, and Scholz would, would probably in a future crisis be relatively similar in, in, in considering his, his sober persona, um, that some things needed to change. And um, I'm assuming that we get a traffic light coalition. So I just want to quickly um, take, a, take a look into the future of what we, what we can expect. Um, so a traffic light coalition is the Social Democrats in the lead with Olaf Scholz as Chancellor, the Greens and the Free Democrats. The Free Democrats are usually called a liberal party, but I think that's a bit of a misnomer in the international context because it's not liberal in the international sense. It's a sort of pro-business slightly conservative, but um, in, on, 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 on civic rights and so forth, a liberal party. Um, as Anna said, the Free Democrats and the Greens have been the winners among the young and will carry quite a bit of political weight. They combined are as large as the Social Democratic Party. Um, but since they will be the kingmakers and both the CDU and the SPD want to govern and want to, um, uh, want to be at the, at the top of the government, um, I think the, the Greens and the Free Democrats will will wield quite some power in these negotiations. Um, so the Social Democrats under Scholz had already brought public investment to a much higher level um, than under the previous Merkel governments. Um, and I would very much expect the Social Democrats to push that uh, public investment agenda forward. Um, but the Greens would want to add a sort of large green investment package, and they have campaigned on a on a 500 billion investment package, which they have to get over the line. Um, so in that sense, I think there is broad disagreement between, um, between the Social Democrats and the Greens. The wild card is about the Free Democrats, but I think the Free Democrats, in, on climate change at least, um, they're 
even though their program was a bit inconsistent, I think they fully realized that a climate change program that only relies on a high carbon price is politically extremely toxic. And so they have a strong interest in detoxifying their own sort of climate um, 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 ideas. And so I think they would be, they will come on board on the green and the climate investment. And this is also the way I see a reform debate of Germany's very strict fiscal rules going forward, even though there's no chance that we would get a constitutional reform of our debt break because you would need the CDU for that and they are in opposition and they're not going to give that position up. Um, I think there is an opening, particularly on the focus on climate change investment. Um, the Free Democrats would like to have a tax cut agenda, a big one, if you if you ask that platform. Um, but that was more, I would say, performative positioning in this debate. I don't think they, they, they really mean that because it would create a huge hole in the German budget. Uh, so we're not going to get the sort of big tax cut agenda. Um, the most danger I see in these coalition negotiations is for the social democratic social agenda. They do have a bit of a redistributive agenda, a welfare agenda, um, making the German welfare state a bit fairer and a bit more generous, particularly to families and children. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a bit of a danger there because um, it's, it's the, the Free Democrats as a sort of liberal pro-business conservative party uh, are unlikely to uh, to compromise uh, much on that front. Um, and the Greens will have to push them a lot on the, on the green investment agenda. So that's why I'm slightly hesitant to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, for the, for the Social Democrats, I'm a bit nervous to what extent they can get their points into this, uh, into this uh, final coalition agreement if it comes to pass. So this would be sort of the rough outlook on, um, with a bit of looking back of the, of the general election on economic policy and happy to come back to any questions that might arise. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, and let me again ap apologize. I understand our YouTube connection was slightly faulty um, earlier. Um, so finally, we're, we're, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. A traffic light coalition uh, seems uh, to be gaining some attraction, at least in this panel, um, with the Free Democrats and the Greens as kingmakers, of course, and therefore, in fact, already negotiating amongst themselves uh, as a way of preparing the, the, the lay of the land for their talks with the Social Democrats later on. Um, we now have, um, let me reintroduce you, as I said, because perhaps um, people weren't able to listen, uh, we have uh, Sophie Pornschlegel, and she is the Connecting Europe Project Leader and Senior Policy Analyst at the um, EPC. So thank you very much for joining us, Sophie, from Brussels. Um, what is your perception then of, of how this debate is playing out in the European capital? Thank you. Yes, thanks for the invite, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to speak here with these wonderful speakers. Um, I think from a Brussels perspective, um, there's a little bit of a disclaimer before I get into the topic of how um, this new German government will play into EU policy and that's um, that EU policy did not play a role in the campaign. So it's a little bit hard to judge what it will be because all you can look at is the party programs. Um, it's actually quite interesting to see that it was not mentioned um, at all during the campaign, the talk shows between the candidates. Um, and that it did not seem to be linked to EU policies, all the topics that should be linked to it as it's uh, climate, you know, the Green Deal with climate, whether it's public investments, whether it's the digital transformation, it stayed very national, which can be seen normal um, that the EU does not play a big role in national elections, but in view of the power and um, the economic and demographic power of Germany within the EU, you would have expected something else. So all I'm saying is based mostly on the party programs, just, just for you to know. Um, I think the first point about EU policy is that from a Brussels perspective, it's mostly a timing issue and not so much a, a policy issue. So it's mostly about looking at, about how long it's going to take to, to create a new German government. We all have in the back of our minds the 2017 negotiations that didn't go that well. We waited for six months and then had a, a German government and that uh, yeah, pushes behind the, the EU agenda. Uh, and that's also looking at the timeline uh, of the European Commission that is almost half mandate. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things to do, whether it's the trend transition with the Green Deal and the digital transformation, but also issues like the Eurozone reform that need to be pushed forward. And, you know, without a German government, you can't do much. So I think the timing issue is the most uh, pressing one from a Brussels perspective. 
The second point is um, on the legacy of Merkel. Uh, there was a lot of media requests lately on what it means. It's interesting because it really is in complete contrast to the lack of, you know, the lack of um, in, in, yeah, attention about EU policy that how much the international media actually looked at Germany during that time. And I would say that the legacy in, at EU level is there were two kind of narratives. The first one was the crisis manager, Merkel, uh, that managed to go through this crisis decade, you know, financial crisis, euro crisis, migration crisis, Brexit a little bit, and then COVID. And there's a more critical one that says that she really lacked strategic vision and that she didn't manage to push forward a lot of policy files that really needed to be pushed forward uh, independent of the crisis. So I think that's like the, the legacy that you, you will see here. Um, when it comes to the new government, um, we'll have to see how Olaf Scholz would position himself. Um, I, from his own personal style, I don't expect too much of a change, but I think from a policy perspective, maybe uh, you could see some, some changes, but there it also very much depends on the coalition agreement and whether the Liberals will move on certain issues, especially when it comes to fiscal policy. Um, that le lets me to my third point about the the next coalition, I think on a policy, I mean, we all expect to have traffic light. It's not completely sure we might have Jamaica with the conservatives, but as it looks like, you know, traffic light is the more, more, well, yeah, convenient option or yeah, the more likely option. Um, and there, I think it will very much depend on how the Greens and the Liberals will negotiate also on Europe and what position EU policy will have in the negotiations. Um, to go back to 2017, uh, EU policy had four pages in the last coalition agreement, which was uh, almost nothing. They made a big thing out of it because it was in the first position of the coalition agreement and that they said the EU was extremely important. But the problem you see a lot in Germany is that they tend to have a very pro-European narrative. But when it comes to concrete action, uh, it gets a bit more uh, difficult. And when you get to the nitty gritty, you know, it's not maybe not as pro-European as the narrative might say. Uh, but we'll have to see. And I think some positives could be that you will see a stronger, more ambitious, um, that Germany will put its political weight behind the Green Deal a little bit more because there was the Fit for 55 package that got um, published last summer, so in July 2021. Uh, and this is like, this is a huge package to make sure that we have a uh, climate, uh, yeah, good track climate transition. So Let's hope that, you know, Germany will put its weight behind that. Um, and I'm sure that Shaheen will, will mention it, but I think on taxation and fiscal policy and public investments will be, it will be much more difficult if the Liberals decide that they don't want that, because I think the positionings on EU policy between the Greens and the Liberals are very contradictory, um, much more than between the Socialist, uh, Social Democrats and the Greens. Um, that was my third point. My fourth point, maybe very quickly on foreign policy, but more generally, um, I think foreign policy was mostly mentioned because of the left, uh, that is the outlier and really had very radical positions as leaving NATO and uh, not wanting to spend any money on the German army. Um, I think there we will, I mean, there, there are differences between the three parties that will be part of the traffic light coalition. Um, and I think it will be interesting to see how they position themselves on um, what you could strategic autonomy or how, how strong Europe should be in the world. Um, and that is because I don't see, for instance, the Greens really pushing for more hard military capabilities. They're quite, you know, they want more humanitarian. They're very, very human rights focused. So I don't see them really pushing for having 2% public spending on NATO, for instance. At the same time, um, I think that it could be good if they decide to take another angle and strengthen the EU's position in the world through the economic uh, perspectives, and that is industrial policy, trade, um, you know, the tax sovereignty, as you would I would say, and also that would be really useful, I think, to um, make a step towards France as well, uh, because that um, policy file is quite important for them. But we'll have to see how they position themselves on foreign policy and, and towards China as well. I haven't heard Charles say much about China, so we'll have to see. And I think it's a it's complicated discussions that we will see in that uh, respect. So 
Uh, to conclude, I, I would definitely agree um, with, with Anna that it's incremental change. Uh, it depends, you know, change is very relative. It depends what you compare it to. Uh, you won't see radical change, and maybe that's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think it will be interesting to see what comes out of the coalition agreement and in which direction the new government wants to steer um, Germany and also, in that case, German EU policy. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, we now have with us uh, Shaheen Ballet. For those of you who didn't uh, hear my first introduction, he is at the German Council on Foreign Relations, where he runs uh, that institute's geoeconomics program. The floor is yours, Shaheen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. Um, so a, a lot of ground has been covered, which makes my intervention uh, both easier and more difficult at the same time. Uh, I, I tend to share uh, a lot of what has been said about the likelihood of a, of a, of a traffic light uh, uh, coalition, and I tend to share most of what has been said about the policy consequences of that. I think on the whole, my main message would be that, yes, we are witnessing quite profound political changes in Germany, not only because it's the end of, a, of an era, but also because there are important shifts taking place. Uh, uh, politically. That being said, I don't necessarily believe that these important political shifts will result in very important policy changes. Uh, and so in my mind, whether we end up with one coalition or the other at this point is not going necessarily uh, to mean a whole lot of very important policy changes. And I know that sounds very disappointing, uh, but I think on the big uh, uh, ticket issues, uh, and in particular on the European policy front or on issues that are domestic but that have a European aspect or consequence, I'm not exactly sure we're going to have a big shift. And I think what Sophie has said about the importance of the 2017 coalition negotiation precedent is, is, is very true. Um, you know, if you remember back then, basically very quickly, uh, the Greens, who had come to the negotiations with quite high ambitions on European uh, on the European front, were very quick to abandon these demands um, uh, given the opposition of the FDP. So I'm very very curious to see what the negotiations between the FDP and the Greens will uh, result in. Uh, because I think that is central and, and to some extent, uh, you know, even though, at the moment, this is just an Instagram picture. Uh, the fact that uh, you know there has been some talks between them two even before uh, there are talks with the the CDU or the SPD is quite telling about the importance of of of, of resolving tensions between the FDP and the Greens as sort of central to any coalition, whether this is a coalition at the end of the day with the CDU or the SPD, even though. The SPD one, the SPD led one is is is, is more likely. Um, so I think it will be very important to see what comes out of the of these negotiations and what is actually set in stone in the coalition agreement. My bet at the moment is not much will be set in stone. Is actually the more likely outcome is that we have a very open formulation in the coalition agreement, so just such that nobody can claim victory. But also, nobody, uh, you know, uh, has you know lost face, and I think that's probably an important starting point, which you know leaves the door open to a lot of things that could happen in the next uh, in the next term. Now, if I bring in France for a minute, you might recall that in 2017, pretty much I think two weeks after the coalition negotiations had started, Macron pronounced his big uh, Sorbonne speech. Um, and I think it's important because that speech was deliberately pronounced in the middle of the coalition negotiations with the uh, clear objective of putting pressure on these coalition negotiations and securing some ground for movement in the coalition agreement. As you know, it hasn't been ex extraordinarily successful. Uh, and so I think the big question for France now is whether Macron tries again that strategy of putting pressure on the coalition agreement by making big European pronouncements and effectively 
you know, extending an, uh, 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 an arm to Germany and pointing to important uh, avenues of cooperation and changes, or whether Macron learns from the 2017 experience and rather, you know, keeps a low profile and lets these negotiations unfold before he makes a pronouncement. Um, as you know, the French presidency of the EU is going to start uh, early in 2022, and Macron will probably set the agenda for that presidency late in 2021, probably you know early December or even late November. So we'll still we will still be in the middle of coalition negotiations, most likely, when basically France, you know, not only uh has an opportunity to say something but probably will be forced to say something by virtue of setting out its uh its uh its uh its presidency's agenda so i think that's an important element to 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 keep in mind um and i think i'll conclude on on a couple of of, of topics that i think are are particularly important uh let, let's say three rather than two uh that are particularly important in my in my mind uh both for the German domestic debate, but also by extension for the European one. So one is, of course, the, the fiscal rule agenda. Uh, and that's a, something that is domestic uh, in nature, because I think it raises a question and a tension about whether Germany can meet its climate objective with the current fiscal framework and with the current constitutional debt break. My view is that it cannot. And, and, um, and there is already a debate uh, in the constitutional court with an important ruling by the constitutional court on the protection on the climate protection law which the constitutional court has deemed insufficient to meet germany's climate objective so we see here the beginning of a tension between uh, the constitutional debt break and the climate objectives of germany can the two be reconciled and if they are to be reconciled doesn't that imply a change in fiscal policy so that i think is one critical topic that i hope the coalition agreement says something about the second uh, has been mentioned earlier uh, is the question is the question of you know how much European integration and how, and how much um, you know European sovereignty or autonomic um, or, or strategic autonomy do we want to move towards? Uh, and, and I agree with what has been said that in fact a a green uh, uh, S, you know an SPD green coalition may not be more forthcoming on these issues than um, than the current one. And so that, I think, is a source of concern in, in, in Paris, and I think a subject of, of, of a reflection in, in Germany. And while I think uh, Germany's views towards NATO's are deeply rooted and, and, and fairly transpartisan, uh, you know, barring uh, Die Linke, uh, you know, given what has happened in recent months, you know, from Afghanistan ranging to AUKUS, there might be also space in Germany for a deeper reflection about European defense uh, and uh, and the need for maybe uh, 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 more national spending and more European planning. Where I think there is a crucial tension that the French don't want to see is that it, I think the French are hoping that strategic autonomy would mean um, European means for French foreign policy. And I think that is something that is rightly unacceptable by Germany. And so I think there is a real issue and a real debate to be had between France and Germany on what are the terms of this European sovereignty and how much sharing of, of the decision-making does that mean? And, and last but not least, uh, I think it's a dormant issue, but it's an important one, is the issue of the legal order. And we've seen that issue popping up uh, with the, the, the constitutional uh, ruling uh, on, on the ECB QE, but I think that ruling, other than the QE, said something about the limits of European integration and how much we can do in terms of fiscal integration, in terms of political integration with the current treaty. And so I think the real question to me as a result of that is how much this new coalition will be prepared to embark on uh, on a treaty revision agenda. It might be an agenda that you know takes 10 years to, um, uh, to develop. But you know how much Germany realizes that with the current treaty, there's only so much that can be done in terms of integration. I think that's an important point that I would hope to 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 be discussed in this coalition agreement. Um, and that's it for me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, and thank you for reminding us of those uh, domestic German constitutional constraints, which we often forget about when we are thinking about how 
Germany can define its contribution to, to European integration. And of course, for stressing the importance of the fiscal rule agenda, which is of massive importance to us here in Spain. And I suppose that Miguel will pick up on this. Miguel, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Thanks to all for, for being here and, uh, you know, covering a lot of ground. So I, I, you know, I will try to be short so that we have a second round, actually. Um, I guess, you know, the, the, the view uh, from Spain on, on, on Germany's uh, elections and the results, I think I, I, I sum it up in, in that, you know, um, most people uh, in Spain, they have a very idealized view of Germany, right? They, they, they try to, you know, to see their ideal kind of uh, uh, society or, 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 or ideological agenda in, reflected in Germany because Germany is powerful, usually seen as successful, efficient, etc. So therefore, you know, everyone has their, their agenda in, in, in seeing what, you know, what Germany should do, where it should move to. Uh, you know, so, so if you are a socialist, uh, then you, you think that Scholz will you bring the social agenda that Christians talked about, that we will have a more social Europe, that we will have minimum wages, that we will have uh, the sure, which is the unemployment uh, benefit scheme at the European level, you know, forever, um, that, you know, the social agenda will be increased. If you're, if you're conservative, though, you, you're more inclined to think, look, uh, now that we have the big Leviathan back, uh, Germany is only the last hope, the last hope to resist this, this, this move and of big taxes and redistribution and, and industrial policy. Oh my God. Why will, why would we go back to that thing? Uh, and so, you know, so they, they have, Big hopes on the liberals, right? Um, that that would be their agenda. And if you if you are really green green minded and uh, and you you are sensitive on all these issues, you think really the Greens will push this. Uh, and the on foreign policy is a bit a bit the same, right? I mean, Atlanticists would think, look, now finally Germany is gonna you know be closer to Washington. We will have a strong unity vis-a-vis -vis the authoritarian Russians and Chinese, and you know this will this will be our agenda for now. You know Merkel has been too soft on 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 the East, etc. If you believe in strategic autonomy, you think no. You know I mean uh, Scholz has in its uh, program um, a sovereign Europe. So now this is the moment that we will increase integration and we will push for strategic autonomy. And if we, you know, if you read the Greens that they are pushing for a European army, oh yes, you know, that's the way to go, right? And, and so, and my take is that most of these people will be all disappointed, right? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more inclined to see that, that there is very relative change uh, gonna happen. Because of you know several reasons, these are all moderate candidates. The, you have uh, you know now three parties that need to find the consensus. If it is with the Jamaica uh, uh, you know coalition, it's actually four uh, parties because the CSU is a, is another party. Um, you know, and I was mentioning the the numbers on uh, you know who votes whom and who wants change and who does it, uh, who do, do these people vote for? And you know, it's more the IFP punch and the link, uh, yes, the Greens, yes, the young, but, you know, this is an old country where the, the establishment is very strong. Uh, you know, people tend to be old. Uh, um, Baerbock, uh, you know, Annalena Baerbock is seen as a young politician that, you know, how can she dare to actually go for chancellery? You know, it's, you know, it's great that she has a ministry because, you know, who's going to run the country is a 60 year old uh, male uh, uh, from West uh, Germany. And so, at the end of the day, you know, uh, how could I, you know, find a metaphor here? I mean, I think Scholz is, uh, is you know, going to perhaps, and perhaps, you know, we have a traffic light uh, um, uh, coalition, um, uh, sit on a very German word, a stool with three legs, right? Uh, Greens and Liberals and the SPD. And um, the thing is that, and, you know, we had a discussion yesterday with Adam Tooze, you know, uh, where he was claiming that Germany had gone through this amazing political change over the past 20 years. And I was like, well, hang on. I mean, you know, have you seen the changes that occurred in France and Italy and Spain over the past 20 years? I mean, Macron just destroyed the political system in France, right? Podemos really, you know, sh you know, shook the, 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 the Spanish bipartisan kind of, double, you know, the big party, the two big party system and, and, and Ciudadanos even, you know, came in as a, you know, as a, 
as a liberal party in, the, in, in this Spanish context, unheard of, right? And I mean, I don't have to tell you about Italy, right? I mean, from uh, Cinque Stelle to the Lega, suddenly, you know, being in favor of the unity of Italy to, uh, you know, Fratelli d'Italia, no? I mean, so so my, my, so the metaphor here is that Scholz sits on a stool with three legs without wheels and the room over the past 10, 15 years, being the room globalization, Europe, the neighborhood has transformed amazingly. It's a changed room. The music is a different one as well, right? And, uh, and so he sits there with a, with a, a three leg stool that doesn't have wheels. And, uh, you know, we are all expecting him to stand up and start dancing. Uh, but, you know, I, I figure that uh, we will, and I, I agree with, him, with, with most of you, that, uh, you know, incremental change will be the day, uh, the, 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 the daily activity there. And, and uh, going to some of the key points of Shaheen, uh, I think, you know, my view is that Germany will still be trying to be in the center, the consensus builder, the bridge between the east and the south and, and the west the north and the south, uh, always do the minimum necessary to keep the house alive or, or, or together. This is uh, on the on the fiscal side, etc. So where there is consensus, and I finish with this, in Spain, no matter whether you're green or red or blue or, you know, uh, I think, you know, the consensus is, look, we need the next generation EU scheme fund to continue. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that's going to be really a big test because both the SPD and the Greens in their program said that they will want to continue this in one form or the other. Uh, but the uh, Liberals said, no way, right? And so uh, a lot of people really here are, are, are worried that this might be the case. And that's why, from what I hear from a lot of my colleagues, etc., it's like, you know, Lindner should not be the next uh, finance minister. And, and that goes perhaps back to, to Christian, whether, you know, or even Shaheen or, or even you know, Anna or, or Sophie, whether you know Lindner can compromise a bit more on that agenda or whether this is a big red line uh, that, that will not be moved. And so we are stuck with the Scholz on a tree legged stool that doesn't move. Thank you very much, Miguel. So it's about quarter two, so we still have half an hour. We're doing fine. Um, so let's have another quick round. Anna, there are people asking us. Uh, we have about 80, 90 followers at the moment. Um, given that you are a Spanish journalist who's been observing uh, Germany events in Germany and the evolution of German politics and society for years, do you think there is an issue here of cognitive dissonance? In other words, um, as Miguel very rightly pointed out, there is this tremendous admiration in Spain. Um, cognitive, cognitive dissonance with regard to Spain and also with regard to Germany. Let me clarify. Okay? For those of you who don't follow Spanish politics, um, let me just remind you or inform you that um, you know, ever since the 1960s, uh, Spain, uh, Spaniards have consistently placed um, Germany at the top um, of opinion polls when they've been asked, you know, which European country do you admire most? Uh, which is your model for Spanish society. So basically the German social market economy has come up on top, um, ahead of France, ahead of Britain, consistently since the 1960s, even under the Franco regime. And yet uh, Christian and others were reminding us today, um, you know, in terms of, for example, infrastructure, in terms of all of those elements which supposedly make up modernity, in terms of, um, the environment, Germany is in some ways actually lagging behind a lot of other countries. So on the one hand, we have this cognitive dissonance with regards um, within Spanish society, but perhaps Anna, you would like to co comment on. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, as far as the way Germans perceive themselves is concerned, um, you know, what's going on here? Young people are unhappy with the status quo. Well, that's what being young is all about, right? Um, so there are no big surprises there. But what's really interesting, I would say, is that, you know, we've moved quite quickly from a scenario in which the two big Germany, the, the big two German parties captured, what, 80, 85 percent of the vote to Sunday's election, where they captured about 50 percent of the vote. Again, as Miguel was saying, that's actually quite reminiscent of what happened here in Spain. Older people voting for the traditional parties, younger people voting for new options. So is there a mismatch then? This is one of the questions I'm getting, Anna, between reality and perception. 
Thank you. You are on mute, Anna. Yes, I, I definitely think there is a mismatch that I've been living. Um, my family is uh, half German, <laughs> my husband. So I, I, I live this on a daily basis, uh, both ways. And, um, and I think it has to do with, well, on the one hand, the complex of uh, the Spanish uh, population that tend to think that anything foreigner tends to be better than what we have here. And to admire in the case of Germany is, is particularly strong, this sense of admiration. And um, there are a lot of myths when it comes to, to Germany. I think there are a lot of things to admire when it comes to the political system, when it comes to accountability, when it comes to the um, willingness to compromise that I think we will see it in the coalition uh, formation, this pragmatism that we lack in Spain. Um, but having said that, th th there are also many aspects, and for me it was particularly striking during the pandemia. Um, in Spain we tend to think that Germans are very disciplined and uh, they tend to obey. Um, the norms and that's uh, yeah that can be the case sometimes but uh, for example in Spain we had a very strong confinement people were in their houses locked um, the, 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 the rules uh, to, for fighting coronavirus were very very strict and I kept on thinking that would never could have been viable in Germany Germans were protesting from day one uh, on the street and they didn't even have to be locked at home. Uh, they didn't have to wear masks on the streets. And, um, and no Spaniards would have believed <laughs> that was the case, no? And when it comes to uh, what you mentioned, infrastructure and digitalization, um, it is a striking. I mean, every Spaniard that sets foot in Germany um, is very surprised of, of what they see. And... Um, yeah, I definitely think, I, I don't know if uh, cognitive dissonance is it's a bit too strong, but uh, there's certainly a mismatch yeah, between perception and reality. Thank you. Christian, um, over to you now. Um, in general, in this conversation, most of you are telling us not to expect very radical changes as a result of these elections. And um, yes, so we're hearing uh, more about German pragmatism and, and transactionalism and so on, which we are familiar with, of course. Um, what kind of reforms then do you think are actually viable in Germany, given this very complex, fragmented political landscape, and given also perhaps some of the constitutional constraints that uh, Shaheen was referring to? Thank you. So I think this um, progress in Germany is usually incremental. Right and on, on on policy issues, and um, there has already been quite a bit of change under the surface, and and the pandemic brought that to the surface. So, if you think about the fiscal debates of how that has changed over the past uh, ten years, um, why has it changed? Well, first because there was a sort of assessment of the last ten years which policies have worked. Was our concern with public debt really justified or not? Um, there's a new generation of economists shaping that debate, um, which have a different experience and a different education, different background. Um, we have a completely different geopolitical situation. So in the Euro crisis, of course, geopolitics played a role, but very much in the background and not in the sort of public debate. But geopolitics and the new geopolitical situation that Europe finds itself in um, is very much at the forefront of how policymakers think about this these days. Um, and that economic strength of Europe and its unity is, and political unity is a lot more important than, you know, uh, how much public debt we have in total. Um, and then there's climate change, which has overshadowed, and as Shaheen said, even legally now, I'm not a legal expert, so I cannot really comment on that, but it's, um, there seems to be a, a growing tension now between uh, different provisions in the, in the constitution. So all these changes, sort of where the backdrop against which Angela Merkel could push for the recovery fund. It was not a, like in the past, a sort of French idea that she reluctantly agreed to on a very much boiled down scale. 
like our, you know, Eurozone budget, you know, big idea, very important in my view as well to talk about this and to make progress on this. But what we got in the end was not a, was not a budget. It was a rounding error. Right. And now we have this pandemic. We have the backdrop of the changing debate. And that was the moment where Angela Merkel could push for a recovery fund that, I mean, I wrote about this in April 2020 um, and thought we thought we were being bold by what we suggested. And Merkel was a lot bolder than that. And it was not, she pushed for it internally in her own party. She pushed for it in the, among the Northern governments in, in Europe that were quite reluctant to agree to something like that. So all of this change has already happened, but it took the pandemic to bring it to the forefront. And I think we can now sort of count on this undercurrent uh, that has changed to also shape the incremental progress that we need to make. In terms of actual reforms, as I said before, there's limited scope for sort of the SPD social agenda or the Free Democrats tax cut agenda. So probably the progress there will also be incremental. Um, the only the only issue where there's no option for incremental process, progress is climate change. And I think this is where the constitutional court's ruling is so important. Not Maybe also legally, I'm not a legal expert, but politically, in the sense that the constitutional court, arguably the, highly, the highest regarded public body in Germany has said that the climate targets that we have set are binding and that policymakers need to make progress towards that. So in a way, you know, that's what Shine said before, maybe the coalition composition doesn't really matter that much. There is something, there is something to that in the climate uh, policy uh, field because we have boxed ourselves in with these uh, targets, rightly, right? and now we need to make progress. And the question is, how do we do that? And I don't think the conservative parties, I mean, the Free Democrats and the Christian Democrats, have properly made up their mind of how they want to do that. And the Social Democrats will struggle with the sort of distributional aspects a lot. So I'm very much, this is, this is, the, this is in my view, the most interesting aspect of this, um, because the target for, of all parties is now legally the same. That's the difference, right, to all other policy. There are different targets for everyone in terms of the uh, public investment agenda, digitalization, industrial transformation, and so forth. Maybe people have different targets. Policy platforms differ. Um, but on climate change, we know they all need to hit the same target, right? And so um, so this will be the most interesting to watch, I think. Christian, um, how likely is it for, you, for, for uh, you know, this traffic light coalition to to agree on a, on a continuation of some form of next generation EU scheme? What, what is your take on this one? So my sense is that they will try to avoid this debate as best as they can, <laughs> because this is not for this government's term to decide, and nobody wants to spend precious bargaining chips on that debate. Um, I think what is um, incredibly important under this in, in these four years is to make sure that the implementation of next generation EU is, is seen as a success, right? I mean, it should first be a success, right? But then also in the debate, seen as a success, right? These are two different steps in this. And, and this will be the most crucial under this government and under this, this government's European policy. I don't think we will have a proper debate and maybe we shouldn't because if there is a sort of, if, if we, the limited capacity of the German debate to digest sort of common European fiscal policy and also the limited political bargaining chips that the more progressive parties have, should we spend those in these four years on sort of the continuation of the recovery fund or is not, is not now the opening for reforming Europe's and Germany's fiscal rules um, in a climate, more climate-friendly direction? Because there is an opening, and this is definitely more urgent, in my view, <laughs> to do that. And so maybe this is the way to go, rather than rather than focus on the next generation EU. Shaheen, I think you wanted to. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something yeah. on on this because, um, I mean, I think Christian is right to say that uh, Merkel, to some extent, has been bolder than what could have been expected because we've, you know, taken a, a leap during this this crisis. Some people called it a Hamiltonian leap. I, I stayed shy of calling it that for many reasons that we can discuss. Um, but I think we have to remember that all of these steps were taken um, on a transitory basis and that there is basically no commitment to, um, there is no commitment to, there is no commitment to, 
You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh, Shane, you're on mute now. There is no commitment to make these these features uh, and these changes permanent, and I think that's going to be uh, an important part of the next uh, political debate in the next term. However, I very much agree with Christian that I think everybody will try to avoid the conversation about uh, you know the permanency of the RRF, and to some extent, I think it doesn't matter because I think that for pure formalistic reasons we will not renew the RRF because we said it was a temporary device and so it will not be renewed. But that does not preclude us creating a new fund for environmental transition in 2026 that is not the RRF, of course not, but that somehow uses the same technology, common borrowing, own resources, and basically achieves pretty much the same thing. So I don't think we should we should bang on the table for uh, you know, making the RF permanent, that might actually be a loss of political capital. Maybe we should just bang on the table for saying, after we've reformed the national fiscal rules such that they allow more fiscal space for transition, maybe that alone will not be enough. And maybe we'll need more European resources for transition. Or maybe we'll need more European resources for defense spending because national budget will not want to do that. Or maybe we'll need more European resources for, I don't know, a new vaccine against COVID or whatever it is. And so I think the door for new common resources has to stay open, whether technically it, it takes the form of the RRF or some other instrument, I think we should be agnostic to that. And if it's easier that it's another instrument with a different legal basis, um, then so be it. So just, to, just, to, to do, just to conclude on that, I could even see a coalition agreement that states the RRF will not be made permanent. And that to me would not be the end of the world. That's a good point because I think a lot of people in Spain would, would uh, you know, be very disappointed. Uh, hyperventilating, because... hyperventilating, yes. Yes. But yeah, Shaheen, I, I mean, I think we should not. Yeah, from your angle, and I think I'm very interested in this because, you know, you are well positioned to, to, to have an answer here or, or at least, you know, an insight, uh, you know, on, on the fiscal rules that might come and, you know, the growth and stability pact and, you know, what what will we end up once the pandemic is over, etc. This is a big topic, of course, for the French presidency, etc. Where do you see the landing zone between, you know, uh, Lindner's position that we should go back to 3% and 60% debt, uh, you know, back to the fiscal rules and that that is a must. Uh, and a lot of the conservative uh, establishment in Germany agreeing with that. Uh, and, and the French idea that is shared in Spain, uh, you know, and by a lot of, and I guess Christian as well, of saying, look, you know, those are old rules. They, I mean, it would be crazy to go back to these rules and that would be, again, austerity in our faces. Yeah. So I think there are two debates that are somewhat distinct that are, of course, linked, but I think it's useful intellectually to separate them. One is what happens in the short term? You know, do we reintroduce the rules in 2023? Uh, you know, on, on, so that's one question. And the other is, you know, how do we change the rules over time? How do they need to be to, to adapt? And to some extent, these are two separate conversations. They're linked, of course, but there are two separate conversations. I think the urgency is to have a settlement on what do we do with the rules in the short term? Because I think the uncertainty that we have now is casting a shadow over fiscal policy today. The fact that we don't know if we'll have the rules back in 2023, if we have them, how do we have them? I think that cast, that is casting a long shadow on fiscal policy making today. I think there is a second debate about, you know, how do we reform the rules? what is important, what is not. And that, that to me is a debate that, that can take a bit more time. On, on what do we do today, there are several solutions. None of them are perfect. Uh, I'm inclined, because there is no consensus on what to do about the rules, I'm inclined to choose a solution that is a second best solution, uh, but that I think is the solution that gives us more time and more space. And that solution is to say, we reintroduce the rules. That means we have to put everybody under excessive deficit procedure. 
That means everybody is under the corrective arm of the pact. And because everybody is under the corrective arm of the pact, the commission sets the adjustment for every country. And because the commission wants to have time, it basically sets an adjustment path, a glide path that is extremely moderate. And it says, okay, you will have to adjust 0.1% of GDP for the next five years. And that gives us five years, basically, to think about how and when and how do we change the rules. And so that, to me, is the optimal path, because optically, we can say, oh, no, we follow the rules. You know, we haven't changed the rules. We've respected the rules. Everybody's under EDP. But also is the path that gives us the, mo the most macroeconomic fiscal space, in the, not only in the short term, but also for the foreseeable future. And that gives us five years to think about how do we want to reform the rules. And last, I would, you know, again, you know, be reminded of, of the usual constructively ambiguous compromise that we find in Europe. I could imagine a compromise where we say, no, 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 we will not reform the rules. We will not touch them, the 3% and the 60% and all of that, none of that has to will change. But because we have climate commitments now, we will create a big trench inside the rules such that all of the green investment is taken out of the rules. And that's a way for everybody to have, um, um, you know, a, to claim some sort of victory. The conservatives will say, look, you know, we haven't changed the rules. We've, we haven't changed anything. The 3%, the 60%, all of that stays. And the progressives will say, well, look, you know, we've secured one and a half percent of GDP every year for green investment. You know, that's, you know, that's incredible. You couldn't think of that two years ago. And so here again, you know, going back to the coalition agreement, you know, even if we had a language that sounded tough on, we're not going to change the rules, I wouldn't worry so much because that language might be accompanied by but we need the public investment to uh, allow uh, for a green transition. And in that case, that might actually be the door opener for quite ambitious reforms of the rules, but of course, without saying that we have reformed them. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask Sophie something. There are people asking us um, about the impact of AUKUS on the German political debate. And it's quite surprising, actually, how quiet the German authorities have been uh, in response to this. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is because it, it's understandable Germany doesn't want to get caught up in a, in a Franco-US conflict. Um, but the questions that, that are being raised is, is, the questions being raised basically is this, you know, how, how is Germany adapting to the disappointment of a Joe Biden who is distinctly underwhelming? Um, America is back, is it really? And how do you see the uh, German-US relationship developing? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I think it's as I think I, I would really go with what Christian said on, on the fiscal policies is that you see that it will be incremental change. And I, I don't think that there will be a lot of difference now with the traffic light coalition or a new German government saying, oh, we're not transatlanticists anymore. There will still always be a tension between, you know, strengthening European defense and European foreign policy and the transatlantic relations. And I don't think that it will change in the past four year, next four years, but I can see that maybe step by step they will realize. I think the fact that uh, they realized that Joe Biden did not massively change its foreign policy compared to his predecessors might be a first step, but it will take a lot of time because it's historically anchored within German foreign policy. And I think the reaction that you could see waiting for a while, you know, not being, uh, trying always to be an honest broker is really the kind of position Germany sees itself in, in foreign policy and also in European um, policy, yeah, w in Brussels. Um, and that goes to the point, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I have much more to say. We'll see how it goes with the, uh, with the Trade and Technology Council as well uh, in that respect. Um, I hope that they will move forward, but I can understand France's reluctance as well. And I think defense has always been a contentious issue between France and Germany. Um, I don't think that the main issue is that you do have different national interests. The question is whether they you have the political will to move forward. And I, I wouldn't go as far to say that the next German government will have a lot more political will to move forward, but we'll have to see. I mean, 
surprises can happen as well in Germany. Uh, the NGU package really showed it. So maybe we'll see something on defense. But I think that the fact that we already had such a big recovery package is quite quite a big step and you need to take it you know, one step at a time. Um, maybe one of the most important points I wanted to make is I think there's really an issue with German leadership in Europe. And this is something that the next German government should think about much more. Um, you could see it very much during the German Council presidency that they see themselves as the honest brokers, you know, trying to bring other European member states together, alliances that might not work, you know, being the, the kind of dialogue fosterer between the North and the South, especially. But I think that's a position that can be very dangerous as well, because Germany has profited from the EU. It has very clear national interests. And the fact that it has, you know, through the crisis, even, you know, fostered its position within the EU, uh, is just a fact. So I think the question is like, how will they use their power position uh, is one that you would have to see much more in the domestic debate in Germany and that I would like to see, um, especially as the, the pressure will get bigger. And we didn't talk about it much, but on rule of law, for instance, I think that this is an issue that isn't going away. When it comes to European cohesion, uh, that's the same. And that's, I mean, I think the recovery package was a very good reason why they agreed because they realized that you would have enormous inequalities as well. So they were like, okay, we really need to go that way. Um, but I think it's it's a tension that won't go away in the coming years. And that's something that Germany really need to think about as in, will they keep this kind of, you know, honest broker position? And how do they want to use that leader pos leadership position in Europe in the future? Thank you very much. I have a final question for Anna and perhaps Miguel as well. The um, Spanish media is making a great deal of the fact that, you know, social democracy is back in Europe. I'm not sure that this is actually uh, a very sophisticated analysis, but it's for you. It's up to you to tell me. Um, so, you know, do you think this is actually a relevant um, conclusion, a plausible conclusion to come to? And, and as far as the Spanish-German dimension is concerned, Miguel rightly underlined that um, there are very few hang-ups in Spain about acknowledging uh, German as the, the key European player. That's really not a very controversial thing. But do we see, do you both see any um, possibility of a closer um, Spanish-German understanding if and when there are two um, social democrats running both governments in the next future, in, in the near future? Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure social social democracy in, in Germany is back. I think Scholz is back. Um, the party, uh, and I think Scholz is back uh, despite his party. Uh, the, the SPD has been um, uh, running very low for years and even until weeks uh, before this election, and there's no sign of recovery. Um, I think what they've done very well is um, to show unity in the run up to the elections. Uh, as we all know, the, the, the presidents of the party are belong to the more left wing. Uh, of, of, of the SPD, whereas uh, Scholz is more the centrist uh, um, candidate and uh, represents the center of the party. But those differences haven't emerged during this campaign. And I think, you know, now I'm in England, and like <laughs> Labour, um, the Germans have been very disciplined on, on that. And, and then Scholz made a good campaign in the sense of doing not much, but letting others uh, make big mistakes, uh, mainly uh, Laschet from the CDU, and um, and I think that's that's uh, that explains basically um, the electoral success. That it's not such because I mean it's it's twenty five percent. It's the third worst result for the party um, in modern Germany, and. Yeah, the others did worse, but um, I would not be so triumphalist when it comes to um, a surge, a revival of the social democracy. Okay, so we've had a very German earthquake, and now you've just described a very German victory. Uh, Miguel, um, German-Spanish relations. Yeah, and, and one thing on Scholz and the social democrats, I think, you know, the focus on respect was, was very important. I think, you know, that... Uh, 
I think the cliff between the elites and the population is big everywhere. And I think he was able to this focus on respect uh, to, to, you know, to bring, I think, a lot of, of new votes for the, for the party. And, and especially, of course, in Eastern Germany, we have not talked about, you know, the big divide still in Germany. And uh, I mean, uh, unlike in 2017, the Social Democrats actually won. If, you know, East Germany would be just a country, they would have won. Uh, and uh, the AfD, AfD did that in the past uh, election. So that's that's a big shift. And I think that's that's crucial. And I think the zeitgeist uh, uh, has changed. And I think Christian, Jaim, you know, all of us, we pointed that, you know, I think now there's more understanding in Germany, even, you know, when I talk with a lot of CDU people, that public investment had been neglected and that we need more public investment. And I think that 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 is not you know, rather than perhaps social democracy. But I think a, a, some sort of the distributive agenda is, is back to, um, um, despite the FDP maybe blocking it, that would be, a, maybe that would be, you know, the problem really, yeah, that, you know, that, that's my problem, that perhaps the FDP would block that when it's obvious that I think it is needed, right? Um, uh, on, on Spain and Germany, I mean, uh, we have, as you know, done quite a bit of work on this and the feeling is, look, you know, these two countries should do much more together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Berlin does not look enough to Madrid. Uh, Madrid is not uh, proactive enough to, to lead some dossiers to be more active in Brussels. And, uh, and you know, uh, my colleague, Matteo Molina, he had this, this term of a sweet politic, right? I think Germany not only needs an Ost politic, but it needs a sweet politic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about the importance of Africa, but there's no real strategy in, in, in Germany around Africa. And I think there, you know, I mean, this is really a big agenda for the whole of the, of the union, right? You know, the relationship with Africa, with mm -hmm. all its different uh, dimensions. And so I think there's huge potential. And even like, you know, officials from the German embassy here constantly say that they struggle to tell Berlin, you know, that more can be done with Madrid. You know, that this is a European country, strongly European, a big country that, you know, has a lot to offer, you know, in digitalization, for example, you know, much more advanced in Germany. And and somehow, the, I think the civil society connections between the two countries, and this goes back to Anna's, you know, uh, kind of misper misperceptions and mismatches, that needs to be increased more. And as you know, Charles, this is one of my big aims in life. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank all of you. And, and, and one of the purposes of these debates is to challenge uh, cliches. So we've heard that the Germans are in fact quite unruly um, and that uh, Spaniards are incredibly law abiding and obedient. And Spaniards are also incredibly punctual, by the way. So I'm afraid all good things must come to an end. Thank you all so much for joining us today and uh, for your extremely interesting insights. And I hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Bye bye. Hasta luego. Ciao.